invite you to join me in a prayer. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, by your Holy Spirit, you've guided the counsels of your apostles and promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to be with your church to the end of the world. Look upon us in mercy now and direct us by your Holy Spirit so that what we do at this time may result in the welfare of your kingdom, the building up of your people, and the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, Hope Church is uh, part of the Reformed Church in America, and uh, part, of that, part of the implication of that is how we govern our church. Um, we have something called the consistory that leads our church. Um, it's kind of the best way to think of it is we have a representative form of government. Uh, elders and deacons are the offices in our church. Uh, in our church, they serve three-year terms. Uh, we have six elders and six deacons, so that means every year we um, have two new elders and two new deacons. And at this time, we are going to recognize those new officers and um, install them and as well as ordain them into their uh, offices. So um, according to uh, our uh, Constitution, we have printed the names of these individuals several weeks in a row in the bulletin. We've not heard any um, objection, um, reasonable objection to their not serving, and so we are going to um, install them at this time. Elders have the responsibility of government and discipline. Uh, God asked the elders of the church to encourage the spiritual growth among our membership and help us to walk in the way of Christ. Deacons are responsible for compassion and material maintenance of the church. God asked the deacons of the church to um, handle the finances and help direct the mission of the church. Together with the pastors, the elders, the deacons make up the consistory whose responsibility it is to make sure everything is done decently and in order within the church um, through our life together. And so, the congregation has chosen... Uh, Arvind Druvinga, Cedric Winterbore to the office of elder, Ivan Crane and Ryan Blau to the office of deacon. I'll ask those four men if they'd join me at this time. I'll stand over here. You guys can stand over there. Gentlemen, I have some questions for the four of you uh, that you can answer together. Then I'll have individual questions for the elders and the deacons and um, so on. That all may know your willingness to accept these responsibilities, I ask you to answer the following questions. Do you reaffirm the vows you made when you confessed your faith in Christ and became a communicant member of his church? Do you believe in your heart that you are called by God's church and therefore by God himself to your respective officers? Do you believe the books of the Old and New Testament to be the word of God, the perfect doctrine of salvation, and do you reject all doctrines contrary thereto? I ask you who have been chosen elders, Cedric and Arvin. Will you oversee and encourage the spiritual growth of the congregation, providing for the proclamation and hearing of God's word, the reverent celebration of sacraments, and the loving discipline of the members. And Ryan and Ivan, chosen as deacons, will you manifest the love and care of Christ, gathering and distributing the offerings of his people, giving personal attention to the distressed, and exercising good stewardship over the goods and property of the congregation? And for all four of you again, will you elders and deacons be loyal to the witness and work of the Reformed Church in America, and do your best to further her mission at home and abroad. Very good. Um, Arvin has been an elder in the Reformed Church before. Uh, Cedric, this will be your first time. So we're going to ordain Cedric to the office of elder. Uh, for both Ivan and Ryan, they have not served as deacons before. At second service, we will ordain them to the office of deacon. Um, so what I need to ask now is all of you who have served as an elder in the Reformed Church, whether this church or a different Reformed Church, if you would come forward to help participate in the ordination of Cedric. Cedric, we're going to have you come over here. Um, typically we would have Cedric kneel, but uh, he's got some hardware in his knees, and we're not sure if he goes down he'll get back up. So we're going to use this 
stool here and have um, everybody who has been ordained to the office of elder, if you would come and join us and make a circle around Cedric here. Uh, those of you closest, if you could lay hands on his shoulder and then so on, lay hands on the person in front of you and so on. I, this is one of my favorite things about this process is always kind of the witness of seeing all these gentlemen uh, and ladies, lady, um, is Sharon here? Oh, Sharon's making coffee, um, who have served this office and um, really this is the, this is the um, foundation of our church over the years that um, brings us to this place. So, uh, Cedric Winterbor, by the authority given to his church by our Lord Jesus Christ, we ordain you elder in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'd stay here with your hands on him, let us pray. Most merciful God, who called this man to this high office, enlighten him with your spirit, strengthen him with your hand, and so govern him that his life and labor may be to the glory of your name and the advancement of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. And now you may make your way back to your seats, and as they do, I'm going to ask the congregation if you would rise. Arvin and Cedric can join me back up here on the stage. Now I'll switch sides. Now I ask you, the congregation, do you, the members of this congregation, receive these persons as elders and deacons in Christ's church? And will you respect them for the sake of the offices they bear, promise to walk in the way of the Lord, faithfully heeding Jesus Christ and these servants who represent him? And may the Lord bless you and multiply his grace upon you to enable you to fulfill your promises. And now, um, I guess this really only applies at this point to Cedric and Arvin, since we have to do this other step here at Second Service. But in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, I declare that you are now ordained and duly installed into your respective office and commend you to the grace of God, which will enable you to discharge all your duties. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Amen. Now you may be seated, um, and let me pray for our church and for our consistory in this year ahead. Heavenly Father, uh, we do thank you for this legacy of leadership we have seen represented in those who have led in this church and, and, and in our denomination over the years. And Lord, um, I pray now for these four individuals, as well as the other eight on the consistory at this time, Lord, that you would... Um, Enlighten us and lead us in the direction you want your church to go. Help us to be faithful in our mission of bringing joy to you and experiencing your joy in our life in ministry. Um, we thank you for Hope Church, and we pray that you bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you guys. You can make your way down. It's for you, Cedric. Uh, switch places with Jay. All right. Well, I uh, wanted to uh, talk a little bit about no apologies. Uh, we've been uh, working on this no apologies for the last year, and uh, every year uh, a group of youth pastors get together, and I get the privilege to lead those guys and uh, uh, in no apologies. And no apologies has been a huge thing here uh, for the past years and uh, been a great opportunity. This year we're doing it a little different. That's why I wanted to make sure that you were informed about it. Uh, we're going to be going to uh, uh, around five different schools, nine schools are actually going to hear the message. So over 4,000 kids next week are going to hear the message from Jeffrey Dean as our speaker. And uh, we're just going to have a blast with him. And 3-2-1 improv comedy is going to kick it off. And so first, I just love for this congregation to pray uh, next week as we start No Apologies, uh, because we're going to actually run it from Sunday to Wednesday this year. It's going to be a pretty intense week. And so I just uh, would appreciate prayers as things go smoothly and all the kids' lives that are going to be touched through this week. If you're a parent, though, I wanted to make sure that uh, you knew about this great opportunity. On January 25th, there's going to be a parent-only uh, no apologies at the Clay County Event Center. It starts at 5.30, and uh, it's for parents only. It's going to be a two-hour session. Jeffrey Dean, the speaker, has uh, just gotten done written uh, new material on like social media and all the things that kids face and things, and it's going to be quite something. Uh, and uh, So I want to encourage you, if you're a parent or if you work with young people, if you're a teacher or something like this, I believe that this is going to be uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal event. 
And then, of course, we do have our Wednesday night. Uh, we used to have a tweens thing, but now it's all going to be on Wednesday. And so Wednesday night at the Clay County Event Center, again, right here in town, uh, we will have the big one uh, where 1,500 kids come from all around uh, the uh, area, about an hour radius kind of a deal they come from. Um, but the cool thing about Wednesday night, it's even expanding. We're going to have a satellite in George and in Orange City. And so this is going to be pretty huge this year. And so I just, uh, as the leader of No Apologies and other youth pastors, they're asking, and their congregations too to just pray for us as we uh, uh, really go out and share a message uh, to our young people in this region. We've seen this is not this is not just a Spencer, a Spirit Lake, and Okaboji thing. Now we're actually uh, ministering regionally. We're going all the way to Rock Valley to a high school, and so that's really neat to see as this expands. Uh, so we're going to live stream it, and uh, who knows uh, what God's going to uh, do to bless this. So will you quick just pray with me for this event? God, we do thank you just for helping us orchestrate all the uh, things that are going to go on at No Apologies. We ask that you already would open the hearts of our young people, um, of parents that are looking for uh, guidance, that uh, they would be able to be filled with your spirit and also just filled with a knowledge to continue to raise our young people up in this world that's broken, that this world that has a lot of questions. And so, dear Lord, as we uh, uh, pray for this, we pray for the speakers, we pray for the comedy guys as they're preparing their messages uh, for us and as we uh, can receive those uh, messages. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of this uh, great ministry. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to continue our worship and uh, uh, the giving of our offerings, and this is a time for us to give back uh, for what God has done and uh, to continue to bless our community uh, that we're working in and the mission that we're doing out there here in Spencer and around the world. Well, as Jay mentioned in the um, welcome, we are in the midst of a series on prayer, and um, I want to thank all those who came on Wednesday during the day and participated in our prayer vigil. I felt like that was a tremendous success. It was neat for us and the staff to see people coming in and out of the building and, and engaged in prayer here, and I, I hope you had that opportunity to pray as well as this um, 408 challenge. Uh, hopefully when you came into the sanctuary today, you got one of these prayer surveys. Um, they were in the bulletins, and we tried to hand them out as well. I'm, I'm mainly looking for adults and high school students here. Um, I have a few extras if you're missing one. Um, we're going to take a moment here and uh, just fill it out right here, and then the ushers are going to come and help collect those. So um, I think this survey, we have a prayer leadership team um, that is working on uh, finding ways to engage the congregation in prayer. And we're just looking to see a little bit about your um, prayer practices and some of your input and thought on prayer. So if you would, please take a few moments here just to fill that out. I, I, Mary, some survey-taking music, maybe, while they do that. Just um, help us to get a little sense of uh, what's happening in terms of your prayer lives and that sort of thing. Thank you, Mary. That might have been a little on the nose, but we couldn't think of anything else for survey music. So, All right. Hopefully that should work. If you guys can come and pass those baskets along, fill those in. I don't know if you want to pass them to the end of your row or that sort of thing. Of course, these are meant to be anonymous. Um, we're not grading you or anything, but if you could share those with us, we can kind of compile that data. We appreciate that.
And as you guys wrap that up, I think I will begin with the message. There are certain things in life that if you don't follow the instructions, don't work out very well. Take, for example, the assembly of a gas barbecue. I don't know if you've ever had to put one of those things together, but they come in a surprisingly large number of parts. Follow the instructions precisely, and soon you're grilling tasty steaks and great hamburgers. But if you don't follow the instructions, you could end up with quite a mess. That's what it's supposed to look like. Um, that's the result. That's a Simpson clip, by the way. Um, on the other hand, there are things that you can approach in any manner of ways and still end up with something quite workable. Take pizza, for example. There are a lot of different ways you can make a pizza. You can make it with a deep dish or you can make it with a thin crust. You can cook it in a convection oven or in a brick oven. You can put anchovies and olives on it or you can just make it cheese. You can make it round or you can make it square. Lots of approaches, still all pizza, or consider a shirt. There are a lot of ways to make a shirt, and yet all these items still qualify as a shirt. You can have an Hawaiian shirt, you can have a t-shirt, you can even have Jerry Seinfeld's puffy shirt. <laughs> but when it comes to talking to God, I think prayer works more like the latter than the former. More like pizza than a gas grill. That is, I don't think there's any one right way to pray. When it comes down to it, I think there are a lot of different ways that you can talk to God. You can pray silently, or you can pray out loud. You can pray alone, or you can pray with a group of people. You can pray with your eyes closed, or you can pray with your eyes open. And when it comes to what you pray, there are a lot of different possibilities as well. Some prayers are arrow prayers. They're just short little prayers that you don't have time to say much at all. Just you sort of shoot it towards heaven like Nehemiah did when he um, stood in front of King Artaxerxes and asked him to go uh, repair the wall. Or, or maybe, you know, you're driving in a car, you hit a patch of ice. You don't have time to say anything, but maybe, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. Some prayers repeat familiar lines, like the bedtime prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. Some prayers follow patterns, like the Acts prayer, the A-C-T-S prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Like I said, I don't think there's any single right way to pray. But we can still learn about how to pray. We can still go to an expert, get coaching on how best to pray. There's not a single right way to pray, but there are pointers to help us grow in our prayer lives. That's how the disciples of Jesus felt. They were spending time with the greatest prayer that ever lived. And Jesus, even though he's the Son of God, come to earth, he was also a man of great prayer. The Gospels tell us that Jesus often went off by himself to pray, that he prayed before performing certain miracles, that, that he wrestled with God in prayer on the night before he died. The Bible even records some of the longer prayers of Jesus, like the great high priestly prayer of John 17 for us to learn from. So it makes sense that the disciples would come to Jesus and ask Him to teach them to pray. That's what happens in our passage today, Luke chapter 11. Jesus is praying when one of His disciples comes to Him and asks, Lord, teach us to pray. So let's read the passage first. Luke 11, 1 through 13. It says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And so Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And then the one inside answers, Well, don't bother me. 
The door's already locked. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet, because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now, like I said, I don't don't think there's a single right way to pray. Jesus isn't giving us the Lord's Prayer and saying, well, every time you pray, these are the only words you can say. I mean, you, you may have noticed Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer is different significantly shorter than Matthew's version. The one we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer most often is the one from Matthew, not Luke. Um, so, so Jesus isn't saying there's just one set way for you to pray. These are the only words you can speak. And yet, when an expert on prayer gives pointers, we ought to listen. So let me share with you four lessons on how to pray from this passage. First, Prayer should always be God-centered and God-exalting. Our prayers should be more about God than they are about us. And I get this from verse 2. And Jesus says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. The first thing that Jesus includes in his sample prayer, the first thing, the thing that comes before all other things, the central, most supreme thing, is a prayer of praise. It's good and proper and right to start your time with God by recognizing that He is God and you are not. The word Jesus uses is hallowed. Hallowed be your name. And it's a word that comes from the word holy. God God is holy. Really, He alone in the universe is holy in its truest sense of the word. It means God stands apart, that he's separate, that he's not like you and me, that, that, that he has no sin, he makes no mistakes, he's pure, he never gets tired or weak. And so in our prayers, we ought to praise him. You know, there's something about flattery that we find a bit off-putting. You know, we've all been in situations where a coworker is always telling the boss how smart he is, or where, you know, when you're a student and there's that one kid in class who's, who's always, you know, kind of going over the top about praising the teacher, and we call that sucking up. And we recognize how shallow it is because no boss, no teacher deserves that kind of praise. We can kind of see the motivation is less than pure. But when we come to God with praise, it's something different. It's not flattery when it's all true. It's not sucking up when we're simply giving Him the glory He already deserves. Remember, the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all all the universe. And So we might as well get started now. And notice, Jesus says, when you pray. And that the Greek word there could literally be translated as whenever. In other words, Jesus is saying this isn't just a formal prayer that you pray every now and then. This is the summary content of normal daily prayer. Whenever you pray, you should express a desire for the name of God to be valued more in your own heart, more in the church, more in the world. And I realize if you're praying a quick arrow prayer, you're saying, Jesus, take the wheel. You don't have time to go into how wonderful and great God is. But this still should be our underlying heart attitude. Listen to this verse from Psalm 40, verse 16. It says, Let all who seek you rejoice, be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. 
And what catches my attention there is that word continually. We should be continually saying in our hearts, the Lord be magnified, praise His name, hallowed be His name. Our passion should be the glo- for the glory of God to be revealed. Our heart's cry should be for God's will to be done on the earth. And the word there, magnified, is also an interesting word. Um, there are a couple senses in which you can magnify something. In one sense, you can magnify something with a microscope. And if you magnify something with a microscope, you take something that is small and you make it appear to be larger. You take a germ, a cell, something that would normally be very difficult to see, and, and, and you, you expand it, you make it appear to be larger so you can study it. That's not what this word means here. It's not like God's glory is so small and microscopic that we need to blow it up and make it look bigger than it really is. But the other way you magnify is with a telescope. And in that case, you're taking something that is really very, very, very big, but appears to be small, and you're making it appear more as it really is. You use a telescope to look at a star, which is astronomically huge. You know, of course, often we're told that these things in the sky are many, many times larger even than our own sun, but but they appear to us as just pinpricks in the night sky until you take a telescope and, and... because of the distance, and, and you make it appear more as it really is. And that's a better analogy for what this verse is talking about. God's glory is enormous. His grace, His love, His power, His name knows no end. But for a variety of reasons, mostly springing from our own sinfulness, God can appear to be small and distant. And so our job, the job of our prayers, is to telescope God's glory. To magnify His name in a way that helps us to see Him as He truly is. I've been saying throughout this series that the point of prayer is not to get more things from God, but to get more of God Himself. In fact, that's that's something to that um, extent is written on our church sign now. The, the, The sign on our church quote, or the quote on our church sign says, we need God more than anything we can get from God. By making our prayers God-centered and God-exalting, we're acknowledging this to be true. We need God more than anything we can get from God. Philip Yancey writes, If I seek God more than anything else, I will eventually seek more of what God wants from me and be content with that. So that's the first lesson from Jesus on prayer. Our prayers should always center on God. Second, God answers prayers for penitent sinners, not perfect people. God doesn't expect us to be free from sin, but He he does want us to be sorry about it. This comes from verse 4. I'll include a part of verse 2 again as well. He said to them, When you pray, say, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And I include the first part of verse 2 here because I still think it applies. Jesus is saying this should be part of our prayer whenever we pray. A regular part of our prayer life should be going to our Father and confessing our sins to Him. It's because of sin that Jesus came to the earth. It's because of sin that He was taunted and beaten. It's because of sin that He died on the cross. He did all of that to take our place, the bear the penalty that we deserved so that we could be forgiven. But just because God offers to forgive us doesn't mean we should take that for granted. The cross doesn't give us a free pass to sin as we want. Instead, we should recognize this huge debt our sin incurs and we should come to Him humbly seeking His pardon. Bingham Hunter, in a book called The God Who Hears, writes this. He says, Those who will see God are the pure in heart who mourn over their sin. A prayer-enabled vision of God is never attained by eyes which have not known such tears. Effective prayer begins with confession offered by one who knows genuine contrition. There's no other way. I've often said that one of the scariest words in the Bible is that little word for. 
Um, in this verse here, and it, it, most of us have the Lord's Prayer memorized, and it uses the little word as. It means essentially the same thing. We ask God to forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. We, we ask God to forgive our sins for we forgive those who sin against us. It's a really important qualification. It's a scary qualification. It's a reminder that if we desire God to show mercy to us, we must be willing to extend that mercy to others. Perhaps this is one of the biggest sins many of us could confess. Our, our bitterness, our resentment towards those who've hurt us, that we're holding on to. Part of our prayer should be asking God to give us the grace we need to forgive the people who've done us wrong. And the good news here is that God answers the prayers of sinners, not perfect people. You can become perfectly paralyzed in your praying if you do not focus on the cross and know that in the cross there is forgiveness available. Notice the way, in verse 13, notice the way Jesus calls us evil. He doesn't mean that we're out of fellowship with Him. He's not saying that we're irredeemable. But he is recognizing that as long as we live in a fallen world, we still have to deal with sin. The, the sin is still a part of our reality. John Piper writes this, We are simultaneously evil and redeemed. We're gradually overcoming our evil by the power of the Holy Spirit, but our native corruption is not obliterated by conversion. We're sinners. We're beggars. And if we recognize this sin, fight it, and cling to the cross of Christ as our hope, then God will hear us and answer our prayers. We don't need to be perfect, just penitent. We don't have to be sin-free, but we should be sorry for our sins. So, two lessons. Uh, Jesus says, make your prayers God-centered, God-exalting. Um, come seeking forgiveness for your sins. Then third lesson is this. Our Father in Heaven never gives us a snake when we ask for a fish. In other words, God knows what's best for us, even when he doesn't give us exactly what we ask for. This is verses 11 through 13. Jesus says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, even though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who? Who ask him? You know, what Jesus wants you to do here is imagine a hungry child going up to his father and saying, you know, Dad, Dad, I'm hungry. And the dad says, Oh, sure, son, I'll, I'll, I'll fix you a fish. Then he sets the plate in front of his son, and there's a poisonous viper there instead. Now the dad says, Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, son, I'll fix you an egg. But then he puts the bowl down, and there's a scorpion in the bowl. That would be like the world's worst practical joke. We would say a dad who would do that would be cruel. We'd even call him abusive. And Jesus is saying, not to put too fine of a point on it, Jesus is saying, look, you guys aren't exactly superstars of virtue. And even you know that to do something like that to your kid would be bad. And he's saying, well, now don't you suppose your heavenly father, your perfect father in heaven, don't you, don't you suppose he knows the same thing? He's a perfect father. He's not a defective parent like the rest of us. He's not about to play a cruel joke on us. Now notice, this does not necessarily mean that whenever we ask for fish, we'll get fish. Or to put it another way, Jesus is saying, you know, just because you ask God for candy doesn't mean he's going to give you candy. I mean, if you're a parent, you know you don't always do that. Sometimes you need to say, well, not, not now. It's a half hour to dinner. You just wait. God's not always going to give every request exactly the way we ask it. But he's, going to, he's not going to give us a snake or a scorpion either. God is a perfect father. That means he will always give his children what is good for them. Listen to John Piper again. He says, we must keep this simple fact before us. God is Father and we are children. The Father always keeps the right to do what is best for the children, even if they don't understand why it's best. 
If this were not so, then we would be saying that we should run the father's house, that we should be the father, and he should be the child, which in this case would mean we should rule the universe and God should learn from us how to do it. Prayer has never meant that God should stop being God. We do not have the wisdom or the grace to run the universe. God is God. And He will continue to decide how to run the universe in the best way possible. If we ask Him for fish, He will not give us a snake, but He may give us Pepto-Bismol, or ibuprofen, or grapefruit. He'll give us what's good for us. And what this means is that if you've been praying for something to happen, and it doesn't happen, or if in fact the opposite thing happens, what this means is that God did not give you some booby prize. He's not playing a joke on you. Maybe you prayed for someone to be healed, but they died. Maybe you prayed that God would give you a job, but it, it went to somebody else. Maybe you prayed that God would heal a relationship and it ended up going south. You might feel like God gave you a snake, but he didn't. You have to believe that your Father in heaven knows what's best for you. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons when we pray, we'll pray a phrase like, if it be your will, or, or, or thy will be done. I mean, that's not a cop-out. Okay, that's not like some sort of escape clause that we build into our prayers so that if God doesn't do what we're asking, he's sort of off the hook because, you know, we said if it's your will. The reason we pray that is because we're acknowledging that he's God and we're not. We're saying you have all the information, we don't. And so we're saying, God, from our perspective, we think this is what would be best, but you're the one who knows for sure. The important thing is that as his children, we trust that our perfect Father in heaven knows what's best for us. We might have asked for a fish. We might have asked for a lollipop. And he might have had to say, no, it's a half hour till dinner. Here's something better. And the fourth lesson from these verses is this. God wants us to persist in prayer. God desires for us to keep praying, never give up. This is the point of the strange little parable about the neighbor, verses 5 and 6. Jesus says, then he said to them, well, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Okay, this was a culture that placed a high value on hospitality. It was expected. If someone comes by your house, you, you are, you're going to welcome them in. You are going to provide a meal for them. You're going to provide them a place to rest, oils to bathe with, all of those things. Hospitality was valued. If, to, to not show good hospitality is to bring shame to your name. It, it's really to bring shame to your entire village. And so even if somebody shows up in the middle of the night, which maybe even wouldn't have been all that rare in a desert culture, maybe it'd be preferable to, to travel in the cool of the evening. So someone arrives unexpectedly at your house at midnight. You're going to welcome them in. You're going to provide for them, even if you don't have enough bread on hand to feed them. In that case, you'll go next door to the neighbor and you'll ask for some help. Verse 7. But then the one inside says, Don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Now, this would have been considered outrageous behavior. The people, the people in Jesus' audience could not imagine something like this happening because not only, you know, the friend has come to visit you, but really the whole reputation of the village is at stake. And so, so it's kind of considered the obligation of neighbors to pitch in and help to make sure that there's, there's food for guests whatever time they arrive. And so nobody could imagine... Anyone in Jesus' audience would have thought, well, if the neighbor comes and knocks on my door, I, I will help. And so the fact that this man attempts to turn his neighbor away would have been considered shocking. Well, then comes the punchline, verse 8. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And the point here is not to say that God is like this cranky, sleepy neighbor 
Rather, as we just saw from verse 13, God is so much better than we flawed, imperfect, evil human beings. So the point is that if even a sluggard of a neighbor will eventually get up and respond to persistent and bold knocking, how much more will God respond to your bold persistence in prayer? And that's Jesus' point, verses 9 and 10. He says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus is saying, keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. God has his reasons for waiting. God has his reasons for answering our prayer differently than we might want. It's not always going to make sense to us, just as you know, the, a man who won't get up to help his neighbor wouldn't have made sense in that culture. But God still wants us to keep asking. He wants us to keep knocking. Because notice, if the neighbor didn't keep knocking, he wouldn't have got what he wanted. If he would have gone away at the first refusal to help, then there would have been no bread for his guest. Jesus says it's because of his boldness that he received. And so the lesson here is that persistence in prayer will prevail with God where giving up will not. Let me say that again. Persistence in prayer will prevail with God where giving up will not. God invites our argument. God invites our persistence. Even when he does not immediately grant our request, that doesn't mean he wants us to stop asking. So how do we answer the question, is there a right way to pray? Well, there are a lot of ways to pray. But here are four lessons from the master of prayer. Put God at the center. Confess your sins. Always remember that the Father knows what's best. And then never give up. Keep on praying. Until Jesus tells you to stop. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for for what you teach. And there are so many mysteries that surround prayer, so many questions. We answer one question, it just raises a dozen more. But we thank you, Lord, for what you do say to us here, the importance of keeping you at the center of our prayers, of remembering that you are God and we are not. And Lord, we ask for the grace to trust you, to trust that you know what is best, in every situation. And Lord, give us the desire, the energy to pray, to keep on praying, um, knowing that you delight to hear the sound of our prayers. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I guess I'm I'm learning this in my own life, and I'm sure it's true in your life, too. If you want to learn how to pray, pray. I... The more you give yourself to prayer, make time for prayer, answer that alarm, um, uh, get together with somebody else, and even if you're not really comfortable praying with somebody else, challenge yourself to do that. And and the way you're going to learn to pray is by experiencing prayer, by opening that channel of communication with God, by talking to Him. And so I want to encourage you in this as, as we as a church continue this journey in prayer this month and to next, um, that you would uh, pray. As you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go before you to guide you, above you to watch over you, behind you to protect you. May he go beneath you to lift you up, beside you to befriend you. Most of all, may he go within you to give you his peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.